So um, I wanted to get uh, Senator Paul's thoughts. Uh, listen here, Senator Paul. I did not perform gain-of-function research of that type. I did not perform that gain-of-function research, and I will not disclose to you or the Congress how much money I made from the vaccines. Well, let it just be known, Kyle, for the record and for the Senate panel, that Dr. Fauci, you've refused thus far to answer any of my questions. <laughs> there were labs in Ukraine that were doing spike protein work and looking at gain of function, and you refused to talk about it. You furthermore let the committee know and the panel understand you've never answered my claims of dogfighting with Michael Vick. And you will have to answer it one day. Me and RFK Jr. will be coming to your house with our, with our lawn trimmings. What is up, everybody? My name is Kyle Matovic. I am the host of the In Liberty and Health podcast, where we talk all things liberty, health and wellness, and beyond. My hope is to encourage and spread the message of liberty, and physical and mental well-being. I hope you enjoy all the topics we talk about with our guests. We're on all major streaming platforms, so please sit back, relax, and enjoy. Man, I'm doing as good as anyone can do getting buried by his 13-year-old son on leg day. <laughs> I'm not going to apologize for not being on this podcast because I got to go see Metallica. So if that's a problem, kiss my ass. Oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> All right. Let me. Oh, no. Oh, no, no we're guys. Good. We're good. We're good. <laughs> this is in Liberty and Health episode number 150, I think. I can't believe that. I've been doing this for... About over a year now, Eric was on close to a year ago and then a couple months ago. And now um, coming on with him is his uh, twin brother, Mike. So uh, I guess we'll start with you, Mike. How are you doing today, man? I'm doing very well. How are you, Kyle? I'm um, fantastic, Eric. I'm awesome. I'm really happy to be there. Thanks for uh, asking us on. And you got you got some you have some huge things coming up in your life right now, Kyle. Some really big things. You turned 28 yesterday. You're marrying the girl of your dream. She's a beautiful woman. She's a talented woman. You better be careful. I'll send one of my friends to come pick her up if you're not careful. But uh, big congratulations to you, Kyle. You've got some great things coming up, and uh, I'm psyched for you. Nah, dude, I, I appreciate it. And uh, she's, she's a little, I like my women a little bit younger, okay? I, they're, they're very great, but I just like them a little bit younger. She might be a little bit too old for me, but I, I like her. Well, I rented um, the Beach Boys starring Mike Love for Ivanka on her 16th birthday, or what they usually call a quince, and it was a really great time. And I even had her sit on my lap, so we had a lot of fun with that. It only cost me $150,000, if you can believe it. <laughs> Yeah, maybe a few golden showers along the way. Well, you know what? No, I think he, I think he'd probably pay for those. He paid top uh, rubles, Mike, for the waterworks that happened there in Moscow at Miss World. What well, year was that, Mike? Uh, two thousand five or six. Yeah, somewhere around there. When he, when he, well, when, well, no, it had would have had to have been when Twitter was still in its infancy. So like 2011, 2012, 2013. Because he tweeted, maybe me and Putin will be best friends. I'm having Miss World in Moscow. Some people are saying he's coming. I think he's going to come. Okay. I'm definitely coming. Believe me. <laughs> the, the Everything's thing going to be everything. sanitized before we do it. And they're going to eat a lot of asparagus and they're going to drink a lot of water. And it's <laughs> going to be tremendous. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. So it seems like you guys are pretty tight. And uh, this is something that I really wanted to uh, kind of hit on with you guys is that, uh, my older brother and I, we're about a year and a half apart. It, you guys are like twins, right? Oh, we are I'm, twins. <laughs> I'm two minutes older than Mike. We, okay. were, we were born October the 10th, 1986. Framingham, okay. Massachusetts. I was born and then Mike was two minutes behind me. Ah, okay. So he's he's the younger one. Yeah, if you put me and my older brother beside each other, you would think I'm the older one because I'm a little bit taller. I have darker hair and I have beard and he's like shorter, lighter hair. But um. Him and I quite butted heads a lot, but then I remember my dad saying this to me when I was pretty young, but he said, you know, you two should really get along because eventually you two are going to be the only people that you guys really have. And it stuck with me and we had a pretty rocky relationship, but then, um, I don't know, as soon as we kind of matured into adulthood, um, we got really, really close and we're still pretty tight to this day. Actually, he's going to be my best man at my wedding. So, nice. um, what was it like for you two growing up? Because it seems like you guys are like, you know, joined at the hip, essentially, not like any kind of bad way, but like you guys are pretty tight. Um, what was it like growing up for you guys? Because I've heard a little bit of uh, the story, but, um, you know, if you guys want to elaborate, go ahead. Well, it was a lot of fun. I mean, we, uh, you know, we, we did the typical, uh, 
twin pranks you would imagine in uh, second grade we uh, we you know we each wore uh, one shoe from the other twin and went into our second grade classrooms and pretended to be the other twin and it fooled the teacher for pretty much the whole period mm. um, but some of our close friends kind of knew all along or they got hip to it pretty quickly mm. and uh, the cover was blown but you know, we did stuff like that. Um, we really have our own language, you know, which is a true adage about twins. And um, I don't know, I just kind of always say like what George Harrison said, like, what's it like not to be a Beatle? You know, mm -hmm. what's it like not being a twin? I don't know any, I mean, I guess it's kind of freaky, you know, when you think about it, you think about the statistically, what are the odds of being a twin and mm -hmm. uh, making it and being close? I do know some twins growing up um, that weren't close and I never understood that. So like you said, uh, yeah, we, we've always been close. So it's, I, I really, I don't know any other reality or paradigm. I don't know, Eric, what do, what do you think? Is that, is that close? Yeah, well, or? <clears throat> that's how people would tell us apart was our shoes. They would look, but if people had more attention to detail, I'm left-handed and Mike is right-handed. So oh. they would see that one twin, you know, as a lefty and a righty. Um, and Mike wears glasses, although I should get glasses. I've been, I just refuse to do it. You know, I continue to pass my, driver's test every year in the free state of new hampshire so they might not put too much of an emphasis on your vision here in new hampshire um <laughs> but no mike's right it was uh <clears throat> it was special man it, it, you know just imagine that you have another human being that you have everything in common with and you have every shared experience with from your inception to the moment you're born to everything starting kindergarten starting grade school middle school uh, you know, getting, having a crush on girls, you know, uh, sports, movies, music, everything is, is you are, you are on this journey with another person who is basic, who is your carbon copy, which mm -hmm. is, is freaky. It's like science fiction, but oh. it's real. And, yeah. you know, you, you do develop your own language and your own way to communicate. I mean, Mike and I, we can be somewhere with a group of people or be at something and, see or hear someone say something and then just look at each other and do a nod and we've just communicated like a paragraph's worth of <laughs> information and response um to that and then we know that later on when we're just hanging out it's just the two of us we're going to recap every aspect of that whole night and everything that people said and, and what happened and what we saw and it's uh it's going to be hilarious so I don't know if that that helps explain it a little bit, but it's it's mm. it's interesting. It's interesting, but I'm glad to hear you've gotten closer with your brother because your dad was absolutely right, man. Your family mm. is is everything, and I don't take for granted, you know, one day that I have a twin brother and I have a younger sister. She's three years younger. Um, they're the people who are with you for your journey, mm. and it, it's uh, it's very important to try and stay connected and do your best. But you know, we're always not we're not always going to get along and agree on shit. But mm. at the end of the day, it's your family. Yeah, well, you know, I, I, I don't really tell this very often, but honestly, I would not be here in this chair right now talking to you guys if it wasn't for my older brother, because he was the one that really got me started down the path of politics and um, culture and stuff like that. Because originally, I always felt like I leaned a little bit more right, and I remember him showing me like Amazing Atheist videos, and he was like a real hardcore, hardcore liberal back in the day, which, you know, obviously we're both like anarcho-capitalist libertarians now, and uh he really changed the way that I thought about stuff. And like I said, it was just over time, we got closer and we both had a lot of the same interests, but it's kind of interesting because he's socially one way. And I was a little bit more of an outgoing person. Like I'd go out to parties and go drinking and stuff like that. He never quite had the same wild streak as I did, but like now looking at it, we're both pretty much well in alignment where like, you know, he's been with his girlfriend for 10 years and he's very libertarian. And then I've been with my fiance, soon to be wife by the well, wife, by the time this airs um, for four years, we both bought houses in our mid twenties and we both work blue collar jobs. And then, you know, we'd like to go out to eat and, you know, eat shitloads of meat and eat s'mores stuff. So it, it's just kind of interesting how him and I are like a year and a half apart. Our experiences were very different, but we also kind of ended up in places very, very similar. But um, I guess that kind of pivots nicely to you guys went to separate colleges as well. I was listening to your appearance on uh, Media Roots Radio this morning where you guys were um, talking about Mike Gravel, if I got that correct. Yeah. Yeah, Mike, you want to – yeah. Well, um, we both got accepted to two of the same schools uh, that we applied to, Franklin Pierce University in Ringe, 
New Hampshire, and Keene State College in Keene. Yeah, you applied to Keene State as well, right? I if did, and I got mistaken. accepted. So we both got accepted to both schools, um, and we just were like, you know what? I think we want to do college. Um, we want to go to two separate schools so we can kind of do our own thing, kind of forge our own, our own identities. And it was nice to go into a classroom or a social setting um, at Keene State College where I went. And, and not only uh, did people have no idea, you know, about who I was or my background or that I had a twin brother. Mm-hmm. They, they didn't know me. They didn't know my twin. They didn't know I had a twin. So that was, was almost like a reverse social experiment uh, as opposed to what you see to like those triplets that were separated at birth. Mm-hmm. Um, in New York, who later came together in life and became like, uh, you know, micro celebrities, which is a tragic story. I mean, there's a whole documentary about it. Um, you know, there's twin experiments, there's triplet experiments out there uh, with behavioral analysis and if there's similar personality types. And in the case of the triplets there, I forget the name of the documentary, but they found that they were very similar in, in a lot of ways and they all grew mm-hmm. up separately. So obviously Eric and I growing up together and being so close, we were very similar in many ways. Um, but it was really cool to go into a setting, you know, as an 18 year old and uh, kind of do my own thing and have my own experience and, uh, you know, be in different social settings. Um, although I ended up spending a lot of time at Eric's College because it was in my hometown. So <laughs> right. all my really close personal, you know, best friends from college were from Franklin Pierce where Eric went. Um, but there still was that divide, which was nice. You know, there was a little bit of a divide and. I got, I got to have my own identity during four years of college. And um, although some people, because it is, New Hampshire is not a huge state. Right. Some people would run into me separately or run into Eric or, you know, somebody from Eric's college would meet me like a professor or faculty or whatever, or another student and think it was, you know, they were talking to Eric. <laughs> and then they would find, oh, wait a minute. No, oh God, that, that's your brother. And then you'd have to explain that whole deal. I'm at, I mean, I've been at the point for a while now where I run into people maybe I don't know as well or I'm not as close with who just call me Eric and I just fucking roll with it. I just, <laughs> I, I just don't even bother correcting them, you know, because mm-hmm. a lot of the times too, when we go to a, a social gathering or even a family or a, a friend outing, um, you're just going to have a lot of the times the same conversation, you know, mm-hmm. repeated. So we try to, we try to avoid that now and preempt that, but. All right. And just know. kind of roll with it to the best of your ability. You know, I, and this yeah. is going to sound weird. Um, the way I can almost relate to what you're saying there, my dad and I had both went to the same college and then we both worked at the same dealership as well. And part of my reasoning was similar to your reasoning where um, everyone's like, oh, well, why don't you go work for your dad? I'm like, I just got to like do my own thing. You know, I got to like, I got to spread my wings and fly. Right. <laughs> that's, that's kind of the way that I felt. Um, Eric, was it a, a similar kind of situation for you? Like, um, cause you went for political science, right? Mm. Yeah. I went to Franklin Pierce in Ringe, which was our hometown, um, where we grew up. We moved there. Our, our parents moved us there in, uh, <clears throat> 1997 from Massachusetts when we were in fourth grade. And Franklin Pierce is right in Ringe. Mm -hmm. So I have memories of being pretty young going over there on like field trips. They had a huge uh, like dome. It's called the bubble. And it was an outside, it was an exercise center with basketball courts and a track and all fun, like recreational stuff you could do. So I was always fascinated by the college. And then obviously being here in New Hampshire, um, the New Hampshire primary was front and center for everything that happens here Mm -hmm. um, in the small state. So we got our first taste of that. We moved here in 97 and that was right before the the 2000 primary that uh, John McCain beat George W. Bush in, I think by 18 points. And actually there's a famous poll that my political science mentor and, uh, one of my political science department at Franklin Pierce is very small. Um, He did a poll before the 2000 primary that said John McCain will beat George W. Bush by 18 points. And some, some people thought he was insane and crazy and laughed at him. He was right on the money and McCain won the 2000 primary Mm -hmm. uh, by 18 points. But yeah, I majored in poli sci and I wanted to stay here in New Hampshire to be connected to that and part of that. So um, Mike, Mike pretty much hit the nail on the head there. We wanted to kind of forge our own identities and, you know, do something separate of each other. It wasn't obviously so far removed from each other because uh, Keene State, 
from Ringe, where we grew up, was only a half hour drive. So uh -huh. we both we both still lived at home together. Our parents mm -hmm. were incredibly gracious uh, and kind and let us let us stay living at home. You know, we didn't have to we didn't have to uh, move on to campus. We didn't have to get a meal plan that saved us tens of thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm. We didn't have to borrow from the Sally Mae racket and all that bullshit. And it, and it also was unique because, you know, we made our friends at school and got our social groups together. And when they would want time off campus, they could come and hang out at the Jackman's house mm -hmm. in Ringe. We got a good friend. He's a twin. He's this crazy guy. He's into politics. He's into music. And uh, he's from, He's a local. He's from Ringe. He's a townie. But uh, his family, they live in Ringe. They got a house. So if we want to get off campus and do something different for the night, we'll go hang at the Jackman's, mm -hmm. uh, which was cool. So it was a unique experience. And Mike would um, – but it, it, Mike's right. For the first bit of college, I wanted to just kind of like – just be my own person and be myself and not have everything presented as, Oh, the Jackman brothers or the, the brothers, <laughs> the twins, where I was just kind of for the first time, my own person. So mm -hmm. it was, uh, it was very unique in that regard. Right. So um, have you two always kind of been into the comedy stuff? Cause it seems like you, now you guys are picking up gigs and stuff. Now, I don't know if you guys have always done that. And I know Mike, you play drums as well, right? Yeah, and, and that's kind of the uh, a separate thing that I that I have. Eric's obviously into music, and he can mm -hmm. play a little bit of guitar. Um, but I've had a band for 14 years, and oh. we've been all around New Hampshire and all around New England, and we've had some regional success. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have some originals, but we you know we do mostly covers. I mean, we're we're, we're a cover band. I mean, that's what people want to hear. If you want to play at uh, bars and restaurants and venues and um, you know, breweries and stuff like that, public events, you, you typically, you got to play what people, you got to play to the crowd and what they want to hear. So mm -hmm. uh, I've always kind of had that as my thing. And that's a separate thing. Um, but we did both study politics in college. You, you asked that earlier. Mm -hmm. I got my degree in political science as well. Um, okay. But uh, yeah, the comedy, we started, um, we did uh, a play together in four, uh, third grade, The Prince and the Pauper, playing mm -hmm. up on the uh, switching and the twin thing. So I guess it's always been part of the shtick and the gimmick and you got to go, as Donald Rumsfeld said, you got to go at the body armor you're given. You know? <laughs> so you come into this world with a twin brother who looks a lot like you and, you know, acts a lot like you and shares a lot of the same interests and beer. <laughs> <laughs> so you roll, you roll with that. So uh, we did the Prince and the Pauper and then we did a lot of Shakespeare plays and um, we're always into comedy because uh, my dad and his siblings were, very funny, eccentric, um, you know, people from Canada. They're from mm -hmm. Newfoundland, Canada. So think about like the comedian Mike Myers, um, you know, who did Austin Powers. Um, you know, there's, there's a, a lot of great comedians. Jim Carrey is from Canada. Um, uh, who, who am I forgetting? Uh, a lot of great comics are from Canada. So mm -hmm. we've always kind of had that eccentric humor and we love to do impersonations and you know, my uncles and my dad did a lot of funny accents. So that really inspired us from a young age to start like mimicking our teachers and get impersonations <laughs> going. So we yeah. would do talent shows together in middle school, uh, doing impersonations of our teachers and uh, um, like pop culture skits. And actually in seventh grade, I wrote a skit uh, called Bill Clinton's Farewell Address. I dressed up as Bill Clinton and did his farewell address. And Eric had a blonde wig and dressed up as Linda Tripp. And we had a we had a, uh, a gal who was uh, rather voluptuous play Monica Lewinsky and uh, had a friend play Ken Starr. And uh, that was seventh grade was the first time I mixed comedy and politics. And I think uh, I was 12 I or 13 not years have old. sexual relations with that woman. I am stoked to tell you guys about the show's new sponsor. I am now working with MTS Nutrition, which is a brand that I've believed in for a very long time, and they run awesome cells and they have awesome products. So um, I want to tell you about their amazing protein powder, which you're going to ask me how many pounds I have of the protein powder, and the answer is all of them. So here I got red velvet cake, 25 grams of protein, and they have the amino acids and everything on there, 59 servings. Peanut butter fluff, uh, fluffernutter, 26 grams of protein, and then also the chocolate chip cookie, which literally has real pieces of chocolate chip cookie in there. So 27 grams of protein, 180. As I've talked about on the show, getting your protein is very, very important, so make sure you hit that link below and purchase your protein powder through MTS Nutrition. Boom! I did not have sex with that woman, Hillary Clinton. <laughs> so... We didn't even know about Epstein, Mike, at that point, but we were on to something. 
Oh, it's, it's crazy because he'd already been in the White House, you know, with Clinton for seven or eight years. I mean, you look back at the visitor logs, Kyle, it's all there. Is Eric Elaine Maxwell doing Manny Petty's at midnight with Hillary Clinton and all kinds of crazy stuff. But uh, the political comedy definitely uh, informed a lot of where we are today, you know, mm -hmm. starting with that. And I always kind of like a dream in the back of my mind was to be on SNL. Mm -hmm. And uh, but, you know, obviously they wouldn't. They wouldn't want to have somebody like like me on there. I mean, look what they did to Shane Gillis. They hired him and fired him within a couple of days or something like that. Yeah. So well, one thing that I like about both you guys a lot is that um, I, I think I told Eric this last time he was on, but you guys aren't dogmatic about your beliefs at all, which I think is, oh, geez, the dogs are going crazy. The dogs? <laughs> yeah. My uh, accident, Lily. Hey, puppy. <laughs> Only Rosie O'Donnell. <laughs> Speaking of dogs, <laughs> um, Jesus Christ! <laughs> I was um, like, he, <laughs> God. I was gonna say, the bag daddy, he begged like a dog, and then we fired a missile right up his ass. Okay, he be remember when Trump said to Mike, he's like, he begged like a dog. He was down in the tunnel and he begged <laughs> like a dog. He, how did he hear it, Mike? They had like a CCTV live feed of the thing. He begged like a dog. He made that up. That was the New York Street tough. Like I just got a hot dog, and he begged like I, a dog. Uh, he begged like a dog, Kyle. Sorry, what were you going to say, Kyle? <laughs> that's that's fine. No, um, you guys seem to approach politics with a very, very like sober lens, and you don't come in with this dogmatic belief that you guys are right and that everybody else is wrong. You guys have your issues and your principle on the issues, but you're not fucking assholes about it. And I try to approach it the same way. Yes, yes, and, and I'm sure you and like that's kind of what I like about Tulsi Gabbard too is that she kind of has the same attitude. Um, and she's once again very principled and speaks for all of the issues. And yeah, we could find stuff that she's bad on, but like she she doesn't seem like she's like bought and paid for, right? She seems like a genuine person. And like I said, I get the same vibe from you guys. Um, when you guys talk to people about politics, has it kind of been refreshing for people to see where you're coming from? Yeah, for, for some people. I mean, I really appreciate you saying that, Kyle. Yeah. I, I really, let me tell you, I feel seen right now. I feel yeah. seen and heard and my hair, my hair feels smelled. So <laughs> thanks for saying that. And if I was there, I'd, I'd smell your hair and probably say you use head and shoulders. By Biden style. <laughs> but um, absolutely, man. That's how, that is how I approach politics. And uh, um, the really big thing for me since high school has been who's going to be the most anti-war candidate. And that's who I always go with. I don't care what party they are. Um, there's going to be stuff we're going to disagree with, but big picture, who's really going to be the legit anti-war candidate? Who's going to be in favor of whistleblowers? Um, who's going to be in favor of uh, transparency and against government encroachment and uh, encroachment against civil liberties and rights? And, you know, over the years, it's been libertarian candidates. It's been uh, Green Party. It's been a couple Republicans and uh, not as many Democrats, but I voted all over the spectrum since 2004, since mm -hmm. leaving the two parties. And um, uh, yeah, I, I, when I sit down with someone and they tell me what they believe about something or what their political, what they say is their political stripe, I don't just write them off or judge them or make or make a, or, or pretend to assume that I know about what they're all about. I like to talk to people and kind of, mm -hmm. kind of get the nitty gritty. So that's how I try to approach it. And a lot of people are pretty open to that. Some people don't understand it because they they especially the last five to seven years, uh, certain partisans want you to just hate who they hate. And then right. when they find out that you're not triggered and you don't hate who they hate, they're like, well, I hate you too. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know? So, yeah. you know? Yeah, no, absolutely, Kyle. Um, you know, having spent a, a year with Tulsi Gabbard on the campaign trail here in New Hampshire and obviously, you know, introducing her at many events, hanging with her privately off the trail. She came to our birthday party, um, you know, we traveled all over the state. She's a real person. And mm -hmm. I know, I know right now, man, like all across the spectrum, people are, she, she's, she's one of the biggest stories of the last month since she left the democratic party. Mm -hmm. And I get that. And I, you know, I, you know, some of what she's doing probably is like making people scratch their head or like they're perplexed, but Scott Horton made this point and th this was a great point about Tulsi's service in Iraq, that that was something that she lived for a full year. She was over there. She was deployed. She had her people that she was serving with, her battle buddies, uh, people that she was with every day. You know, some of them didn't come back. They got killed. Um, she had to deal with that and, and ha it was have it in her face firsthand. So that was part right. of her experience. So I have many people 
um, who I grew up with here in New Hampshire, that after 9-11, they enlisted to serve. Mm-hmm. They they were saw what happened with 9-11 and didn't care that there was no connection between 9-11 and Iraq. You know, my brother and I were here. We were anti-war. Um, didn't make us that popular, obviously. Or, right. A lot of shit. You know, you're called the terrorist sympathizer. Uh, you're called weak. You're, you know, whatever, any kind of name under the sun they would call you. But we were like, hey, 9-11 in Iraq, there's no connection here. We don't need to go over there to Iraq and do this. Right. Um, so when I think about, you know, Tulsi's experiences and what she did, I think about the people I went to high school with who might have been a year, a few years older than me. She, Tulsi's five years older than me. Mm-hmm. And I remember upperclassmen signing up to serve we had recruiters at our at the lunch who were coming in um to get people to sign up for it and Mm -hmm. you know like mike alluded to earlier because of the family that mike and i grew up around and our uncles who we had telling us about stuff um about the reality of of geopolitical events and, and war and stuff we didn't buy it we didn't believe it and you know we had an advantage over a lot of people so i said guys like Friends would say, yeah, I'm going to join up with the Marines. We're going to join with the Army. We're going to go kill those motherfuckers who did 9-11. I'm like, guys, even if you believe the official line on 9-11, Iraq had nothing to do with it. We we should be going to invade Saudi Arabia if you want to get to the heart of the matter, you know? (laughs) So, I, you know, I can understand. So, you know, Tulsi has her experiences in her background. um, And, you know, some people are probably wondering what she's doing. But look, I, I've talked to her about it before. I, I, I just I don't see her joining a third party or, or joining the Green Party or the Libertarian Party. Mm-hmm. We saw how she's treated by the Democrats. Right. She rose through the ranks of the Democratic Party very quickly to become uh, co-vice chair and then bailed on that when it was the choice between Hillary and Bernie, which I thought was a principled stand. She told the Clintons and the Democratic machine and establishment to go fuck themselves. I'm resigning. I'm going to endorse Bernie. He's less of a war hawk than Hillary. So you got to have respect for that. Mm -hmm. And then you flash forward to how she was treated in the 2020 Democrats. Because she's been with the Democrats for 20 years since she ran for state rep in Hawaii 20 years ago. So it's not like this was just like something, oh, all of a sudden she just made a, like a choice to do or, mm-hmm. or, or something she wanted to do. There's a lot of things that led up to it, mm-hmm. you know? So I don't know. I mean, what, what do you think overall about it, Kyle? Are you, I, I you can be honest, man. You can you be know, honest. You, know, I, you don't I'm, have to. I'm trying to get my full bearings about it. So um, I understand, I completely understand why she left the Democratic Party. But the only frustrating part for me is that she's just towing the MAGA line. Like, she can be the best Democrat, right? And this is kind of like my same issue with people like Tim Pool or Dave Rubin, where they want to have the credibility of being a leftist who's disaffected and went to the right wing and claim that they're not, like, sucked up by all the MAGA chuds and all the, you know, propaganda being pumped out by the right. Which, okay, if... If you are like now officially a MAGA person and Donald Trump's the greatest person, the greatest president who ever walked the face of the earth, that's fine. Just say that. But they want to be able to do both, right? They still want to have the credibility of saying, look, I'm still liberal. So all you lefties, I'm just like you. But I just happen to believe all the same stuff that Donald Trump believes, which, like I said, if you just come out and say that, I'm okay with that. It's the problem of just people not being objective. Like, I just have a real problem with cognitive dissonance when you have people who want to play both sides and they don't want to lose. Like, I am an anti-war libertarian. This is why I speak out about the China stuff so much, because that's going to be the next big I love push. that, Kyle. I love to yes. see that. Thank you. You're, you're very based on that. <laughs> I appreciate that consistency. Mm-hmm. But th- this is the problem. And I'm curious about you guys' thoughts on this, too. So this is actually a decent uh, place to kind of pivot. Um, I like the MAGA people, but I really don't think they're as anti-war as people want to believe. Like, nobody believes in regime change anymore, right? I mean, that's completely discredited. Mm, After Uh, Iraq, yeah. Right. Other than, like, the fucking worst hawks that nobody likes anyways. Like, uh, and unfortunately, actually, well, maybe... Come to think of it, Donald Trump literally came out in support of Marco Rubio, who said we should be blowing up um, aircraft carriers in the South China Sea. And he's still a neocon as the day is long, right? Um, 
But this was kind of what I saw a poison pill about Trump is that he wasn't anti-war in effect. He said some of the right stuff. But then when it came to this Cold War, this new Cold War that we're approaching with, you know, Russia, China and Iran, he was terrible on that. And it, it made a lot of people on the right say, yeah, regime change is bad, but we really need to quit. Like they didn't realize that, hey, regime change was a waste of money, a waste of time and a waste of lives. They said, oh, well, yeah, it was just a waste of money. And we shouldn't have did that, but we shouldn't be doing this so we can go after China, right? That's the new focus. That's why I'm so outspoken about this is because, like I said, this could be the next push. All the libertarians and a decent bit of the Republicans are good on Ukraine, Russia, but China, nobody's good on China. And I'm waving my hands and trying to bring as much attention to that as possible because, like I said, this will be the next fight. And I don't know if Tulsi Gabbard's going to be any good on it because she's endorsing a lot of people who are absolute dog shit on this. Like she, uh, she endorsed Chuck Grassley. And I don't want to sound like I'm tearing her down, but it, it's just, I, I get, it just frustrates me when you see people who want to, like I said, play both sides. They don't want to lose. Yeah, I mean, you know, what I would just ask people, like, really, do you really want to enter into a direct conflict with China? Right. And right now the question needs to be asked, uh, if we keep going the way we're going and not taking any off ramps, do you really want to enter into a direct conflict with Russia? And that's mm-hmm. that's the question that so many people are not asking and none of the punditry class are really asking that in earnest. Mm-hmm. So it, it's, it's kind of fucking scary. I mean, I'll be honest, like, the I... I, I you know, we we joke about how close we may or may not be to uh, nuclear Armageddon. And, of course, Biden was, you know, saying this is the closest we've been since, you know, Cuban Missile Crisis. And there's some truth to that, though. I mean, they, they've really been ramping that up. And uh, now is the time where we have to really talk about uh, diplomacy and, and, and sending somebody, uh, whether it's it doesn't have to be in America or in Russia, but maybe at the next summit where the world leaders are at, which I believe is coming up soon. Let's send somebody. If it's not mm-hmm. Biden, um, if, if it's the if it's the gal there who worked for uh, the Obama administration, who's had a little bit of levity. Ray McGovern's written about her um, on antiwar.com. And he, he was a uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Ray McGovern, but he was a yeah. 27 year CIA analyst who. Poutine. Who, he, yeah, yeah, yeah. Poutine. <laughs> he's very eloquent. He's like, Poutine. It's almost <laughs> like he's singing a song or doing a. Uh, a poem and, and you know dude's like 83 years old still doing this still giving a shit he's still sharp too yeah he is and he survived cancer too and he, oh. he founded veterans intelligence professionals for uh sensibility i think or no, sanity veterans intelligence professionals for sanity i recommend everybody read ray mcgovern as a counter view to what msnbc is saying uh cnn and i mean fox see the thing is i don't give fox a lot of credence even though they tucker sometimes says the right things about what's going on now. Mm-hmm. You still got to look back to Tucker from Iraq and Afghanistan and what he was saying with his little neocon bow tie. Mm-hmm. And it's like, I don't know if I try, I don't trust that dude. And he's still, you know? a, he's a peddler of the China propaganda too. Oh, totally. I mean, look at who his father was. Look at the, you know, his whole background, what he was doing down in, uh, you know, Southern America, just trying to, wanting to be a, uh, a spectator for, you know, the regime change and the coups we were doing down there. Um, but big picture, what we're talking about and and what recently the uh, head of the response and the nuclear response to Russia, I forget his name, he's a military guy, is basically saying, you haven't seen anything yet. Things are going to get way worse. That was this just, is, I think, the other day that, yeah. Just the other day, he's saying this is basically the opening solvo of, of something that's going to be way worse. And that should alarm everybody. Mm-hmm. I don't care what party you are or uh, what, what line you're towing or what rhetoric. Even the the weakest nuclear warhead that exists right now, you know, is at least 30 times stronger than what we dropped in Japan in 1945. Mm-hmm. So that alone should give people pause. And that's really what we're talking about here. There's no winner in a nuclear exchange. Um, mm-hmm. People aren't even thinking about the radiation poisoning. So even if they drop a couple, like what about the radiation poisoning? What, what about the, there's so many factors that are just not being talked about uh, properly because of all the propaganda and rhetoric. And th- that is alarming to me that there's people out there, certainly talking heads and militaristic, uh, whether it's a general or, or some talking head is saying, oh, you know, there could be a limited nuclear exchange and we could win that. And that's just insanity to me. Yeah. I, I just, it, I'm beside myself over that. Mm-hmm. You know, cause that's what you're really talking about. And China's got nukes too. You were mentioning China. I mean, yeah. they've got the bodies too, man. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. Eric? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> it's it's uh, it's scary. It's scary when you think about the ramifications of it and how nonchalant the national security state and, you know, the uh, permanent Washington is about, oh, you know, a little bit of nuclear exchange won't be a big deal. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the reason I have JFK behind me, man. Mm -hmm. 60 years ago, he dealt with this. He dealt with this threat head on. And he, he had belligerence, I think, that that a lot of people don't appreciate. I mean, how we can't really appreciate, unless we're students of history and can survey uh, people who were around 60 years ago who were cognitive of this and really aware of how serious the threat was. It's hard for younger Americans to understand and respect the seriousness of it, of nuclear exchange. Mm -hmm. the, the Soviets, they had the nukes 90 miles off the shores of Florida down in Cuba. We had our nukes in Poland and JFK and RFK did what they could and they back channeled and negotiated. We, we will pull our nukes out of Poland. And Turkey. You, I'm sorry. You're right, Mike. Turkey. You, we, you will pull out of Cuba and we will calm this thing down. We will de-escalate mm -hmm. tensions. Now, you see, I don't, I don't know what the number was. 40, 50, or 60 Democratic members of the House drafted this letter. I think it was 30, if I remember correctly. Oh, Jesus. Was it only 30? Mm-hmm. That's so fucking Cowards. sad. Cowards. No what, spine. So whatever it was, it wasn't enough, Kyle. Yeah. Drafted a letter. We got to negotiate. We got to pull back from the abyss, from the from the brink, and then they got the response they did, and they fucking threw all their staff members under the bus. Oh, this was just something our staffers drafted. This, you know, this this was just we weren't really part of this. We're sorry. We're not. We need to be sufficiently pro NATO. We got to be. We got to give Zelensky untold billions, dude. Leading up to the Iraq War, and this is why I will never forsake Dennis Kucinich. Or, or turn my back on him. He's a friend of mine. He's a brave man. That guy led the resistance to the Iraq War in 2002, 2003. And the propaganda and the warmongering and the nationalism and the fucking fervor that, mm -hmm. that was all on the back of 9-11. I talked about my f friends and peers who signed up for the military because of 9-11. Kucinich was in Congress. He was a very visible person, and he led the, the resistance and the opposition to it in Congress. We have nothing like that in Congress right now. Right. We don't have a shred of the integrity and the courage and the pushback to war and militarism like we did. We had Ron Paul and Dennis Kucinich in Congress together on the opposite side of a lot of issues, a lot of things. They'll be the first to tell you we don't agree on a lot of shit. But what they agreed on and what they had integrity about and what they still do is that military industrial complex and permanent war machine that runs the government, that influences policy, that owns the fucking media lock, stock, and barrel. And you mentioned Mike Gravel earlier. We didn't even talk about Mike Gravel. Um, and he was, he was resistant to this in the 60s and 70s in the U.S. Senate. Leading the charge to say no to imperialism in war we don't we just we don't have it anymore in our congress i mean one of the main reasons i got in with tulsi and became friends with her and supported her campaign she she was at least somebody who who was talking about the stuff and she had the guts to go over to syria in the lead up to when syria was the boogeyman and we got to get rid of assad and we got to invade we got to go over there he's gassing his own people right and tulsi was just like Fuck you. <laughs> Fuck all of you. I served in Iraq. I saw what this shit is. Mm -hmm. I I understand what propaganda is leading to a regime change and what the fallout is. She went over there. She didn't tell anybody. Yeah. She had the balls to go over there, man. And I'll always respect her for this. And she saw what was happening on the ground for herself as a sitting member of Congress, as a combat veteran, um, and as someone who who doesn't does not want to sacrifice American lives. Um, and our tax dollars for a fool's errand on behalf of other interests, other entities, and we know who they are. It's the, the, the prophet. It's the Pentagon. It's Israel. It's Saudi Arabia. It's the media. They they love war. They cheerlead for it. They they can't get enough of it. They won't send their children to die in it. Right. They won't have any skin in the game. 
but they want to send everybody else's children and other people. So when she did, when she did that and I learned about that and saw that, uh, that showed me she was something different. She was, she was, mm -hmm. she stood out to me. And this is why I'll always defend Donald Trump uh, with rocket man going over there. <laughs> right. I went, I, look, I tweeted Kyle. I said, look, maybe I'll bring you a big Mac. I'll bring you something from Bob's burger. Maybe I'll bring you something from five guys. I know you don't have five guys in North Korea. I know that you killed five guys, but you don't have a five guys restaurant. Mm -hmm. But you know, it, t it takes guts to be legitimate opposition to war mm -hmm. and the war machine. And uh, we just, we're missing that big time, man. I mean, outside of Thomas Massey and Rand Paul sometimes, and Matt Gates sometimes says good things. And sometimes yeah, Marjorie yeah. Taylor Greene says good things. But it's like what Ryan Dawson says. We're so far in our own end zone mm -hmm. that we're turning. Well, you, know, do, you know, we know we're doing the right thing because 20 years ago, the neocons and the Republicans hated us and called us un-American and mm -hmm. uh, a pro-terrorist. And now the Democrats are, are calling us the same thing. So um, I, <laughs> I, I, I've stuck to my guns and I will stick to my guns. You can call me stubborn, um, whatever you want to call me. Uh, you don't have my support. You don't have my vote unless you're you're really anti-war. So, mm -hmm. otherwise, you're just virtual signaling. You're full of shit. You have no spine, and uh, you can suck my nuts. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I agree completely, and that's kind of why I get frustrated. And this is probably why I depart with some libertarians who say, "Oh, you can't work with the left wingers because they're not anti-war." And not that I necessarily pigeonhole you guys there, but um. Somebody like Abby and Robbie, who are absolutely fantastic anti-imperialists, um, or even someone like Dave DeCamp, who said, oh, I'm a leftist. Um, if you just say the left can't be reasoned with, uh, you can't work with the left, all leftists are bad people, which I have seen people say all of those things, then you literally just exiled like three of the greatest anti-imperialists that are in this country, like – you can't just work with them or talk to them on this issue. And yeah, there's some bad leftists on war, but like those people, they're an, they're an incredible asset to this kind of movement. And if you just want to say fuck them because, oh, they're leftists, we disagree on economic issues. That's, the worst thing that our government does is war, right? I mean, we've a million dead Iraqis, countless veteran suicide. I mean, everybody probably knows somebody who went over and served and they're, you know, fucked up for the rest of their life because of it. Um, that's the worst thing our government does. And to just arbitrarily say we shouldn't work with people because they have a little bit of different beliefs. It's, it's so silly to me. And I just, like I said, what I like about you guys is that you don't have that same dogmatic approach. And I try to embody that as well. Oh, you're absolutely right, Kyle. Mm -hmm. I, I, I agree. And, and that is how I feel. Uh, I'm willing to work with anybody. I don't care what your party is or your designation or what, what um, you believe about other issues that aren't as important. It, for me, the, the foreign policy and war, are, are, that's the most important. And, and, mm -hmm. and I, I, I really believe that. Um, you know, I was in high school when 9-11 happened. I had friends who served in Iraq and Afghanistan, um, you know, family in the military. So, and it's something I think about every day. I think about the ramifications of the Iraq war, um, you know, what happened with 9-11. I really do think about that every day. I was a freshman in high school when it happened and we watched the towers come down and mm -hmm. saw the enlistment go up. And then they, you know, yeah, I mean, there's documents and stuff that show now that Rumsfeld was saying the day of or the day after, we got to tie this to Saddam and Iraq. You know, the neocons all did that. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's so shameful and so criminal and so disgusting. And to me, so unacceptable that I can't think of anything more vulgar than that. Mm -hmm. There's no tweet Donald Trump could put out that's more vulgar than that then mm -hmm. lying us into that war, which, like you said, killed a million people in the Middle East and Iraq, killed and wounded, you know, 4,500, 5,000 American servicemen and women, you know, who were living with that every day. And, and, and veterans commit suicide to the tune of 30 a day. There's mm -hmm. 30 at least veteran suicides mm -hmm. a day. And I don't know how that, where, what society is that acceptable? How is that acceptable in our society? that once a year, twice a year, wants to put medals on these young men and women and say, oh, you're a hero. We salute you for what you did. We love you. We support the troops. We respect you. When the rest of the year, no, you don't even hear about it. Out of sight, out of mind. It is the real issue. And every fucking generation has this. You know, this is our generation's Vietnam. And it, it was unacceptable 20 years ago, and it's still unacceptable. So I think it's important. It's not something that we should ever shut up and not talk about. Um, it still resonates. 
You know, I, I had friends who got hooked on, on really hard drugs who came back from Iraq and Afghanistan, and they, they were never properly given the help and the medical treatment that they needed and deserved, and, and just discarded. I mean, a, a homeless veteran, the idea of a homeless veteran, and yet that's acceptable. And we got to fight every two and four years with each other about Pepsi and Coke, red team, blue team, wedge issues, yelling at each other, but none of them ever really get down to the heart of the matter, what really matters. And that's why the two parties really have just failed us, at least for my whole lifetime. I'm almost 40. I mean, these people who have been here double the amount of time I've been here and, and they've seen it and we still continue to elect these. It's, it's, it's a, yeah, it's a uniparty. It's a pro-war uniparty that we continue to elect and nothing real or substantive ever really changes. And that's why I think we are where we are now today because of both parties. Right. It's a so constant I'm arm wrestling over the lesser of two evils. And at the end of the day, nothing really does change when it comes to the war stuff. Like we're still sending, you know, tons of people over to die for, for what? And I, like I said, the reason why I'm so outspoken about this next great power struggle, because I do think this is going to be a thing. And you see with Biden, there's just no, no will to negotiate, no will to talk to anybody. And it's kind of funny how we're supposed to believe that Putin's a madman and, you know, he wants to kill and ethnically cleanse all the Ukrainians. But for some reason, we keep hearing they're willing to negotiate. Like there's tons of people in the Russian government that have said, hey, let's negotiate. Let's talk. We're willing to pull back. We're willing to do whatever. But there's just no – there's seemingly no off-ramp like you guys were saying earlier. And it's the same deal with China and with Iran. You know, They're still building nukes. Well, we've been hearing they're building nukes for the last 30 years, but somehow they never build them. And you know, you hear they're enriching uranium at sixty percent now after we've you know completely slapped them in the face year after year after year for you know that country of their Israel. But uh, it's it's so insane to me that the policy is just escalation pretty much at all costs rather than just saying, hey, why don't we try to like cool this down? It, it would be better if like, hey, we could get oil from Russia and we get goods from China rather than we're going to send nukes over there and we're going to fund a proxy war in Ukraine. It, it's it's bizarre to me that this is a conversation that we have to have. Yeah, I challenge people to watch Oliver Stone's uh, Putin interviews. Mm -hmm. Have you seen those, Kyle? I have not, actually. He had unprecedented access to Putin uh, over the course of, I think it was like two or three years. Mm -hmm. You know, Correct me if I'm wrong, Mike. But he got to go right into the Kremlin, follow Putin around, drive with him talk to him and he could ask him anything. Nothing was like uh, no holds bar off the record. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that is a caricature that Western media and our intelligence agencies want us to have of Russia and of Vladimir Putin, that he's Hitler, that he's fucking crazy, mm -hmm. you know, that he's a madman. Ignore everything that led up to his attack and invasion on Ukraine, which I don't agree with. I don't agree with any war, any attack, any aggression against any country. But you have to look at what preceded it, mm -hmm. what led up to it, you know, why. And if you, if anyone could put aside the bullshit and listen to Putin's words, really, you know, over the last 20, he's been in power for 23 years. Yeltsin stepped down there in New Year's in 1999 and uh put you know made put putin was the guy um pay attention to that look at what he's been saying all along you know and uh it can't it, it can't be like a total mystery and a shock why he's doing what he's doing right. so when you meddle in other countries affairs and you fuck with them and you're right along their border and you have nuclear weapons very close to the doorstep of another country a superpower, a nuclear armed superpower, this shit's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, to anybody who was paying attention, this wasn't, it wasn't the total shock of the century. Right. So I, I just think we need to, I need, le we need level heads to prevail and we need to look at what Kennedy did. And 60 years ago, the Kennedy brothers did politics is compromise. And, you know, you mentioned, Kyle, like libertarians, how they're so absolute and they're so dug in. And you've spoken about this a lot. And I'm with you. This is why I won't join the Libertarian Party. I'm an independent. I have a lot of libertarian views. But I'm not going to join a party that is just everything's an absolute. You have to be this. you got to believe mm -hmm. this. You have to say this. 
oh, you're not purity. Fucking purity tests. Right. You know, purity test is not reality. Mm-hmm. That that's keyboard warrior fucking online persona bullshit. There's right. there's that, and then there's the real world where you mm-hmm. have to function and where you have to live and where you have to operate. And that needs to happen with Russia and the United States right now. And there has to be concession. There has to be compromise. There has to be give and take. There has mm-hmm. to be negotiation. So I- I'd fucking send Oliver Stone. I'd send Oliver Stone mm-hmm. over there, man. He, I-, I would argue which American uh, or, or anybody who has spent more time with Vladimir Putin than Oliver Stone. And, and Oliver Stone's not some fucking clown. This guy is a combat veteran of Vietnam. He's one of the greatest living filmmakers from America ever. Most accomplished, most respected, most renowned. He, he's brilliant. You know, I've read I've read his books. I've listened to hours and hours of his interviews. He's not a schmuck, man. He's not an idiot. He's not an asshole. This is a very thoughtful person. And uh, he's got some big balls. And he's met with people who are viewed... Uh, as adversaries of the United States and of the empire. He met with Fidel Castro. He met with Chavez. He met with a lot of Latin American leaders, you know, left-leaning leaders who we view as fucking terrorists and horrible people we need to get rid of. Um, obviously, he met with Putin. It's it's interesting. So I would challenge anyone who's watching this, any American or anybody, um, to, to look at Oliver Stone's perspective on this mm-hmm. and hear what he has to say about it as a guy who who did fight in Vietnam as a young man in the 60s, you know, as a guy who came up through the Hollywood system as a director. He, he has some really uh, amazing insight and interesting things to say about a lot of things. Yeah. Well, one of the things I heard leveled at Tulsi is that you don't negotiate with terrorists. And that kind of tells you the level of, I don't want to say indoctrination, but kind of indoctrination that people have with this idea of people from other countries who hate us and they leave out the context of we've been over there overthrowing governments and bombing hospitals bombing weddings and murdering people by the tens of thousands um they leave that part out every single time when you talk about 9-11 when you talk about um terrorist attacks when you talk about anything like that that part always gets left out and when you kind of add that in, when you understand it, which just understanding actually came relatively late for me. Like I would say probably as soon as like four years ago, I was considered myself a libertarian, but the foreign policy stuff really didn't click for me until um, about, like I said, about four years ago. And then I realized, oh yeah, well, killing people over there is really bad. And they probably hate us when we, you know, go over there and do that. And that's probably the reason why, um, you know, our safety can be compromised here in America is because the vile shit that we do to other countries. And, Um, to your point, when you were talking about Oliver Stone, like we have to live on earth with these people. It's not like a choice. It's not like we get to just say we can share in the planet. (laughs) Yeah. We we could try to do regime change and kill people, but typically we see that that just leads to more chaos than was already there a majority of the time. So it's, it's so silly to me that people don't think like, like you said, we have to compromise at certain points. Well, how do you create a terrorist or an extremist, you know, by blowing up their house, by murdering their family, by murdering their friends, by taking away economic and job opportunities from from these young people in the Middle East? You know, I mean, I just say to people on a, on a basic level, how would you feel if a fucking bomb dropped on your mom's house? Right. You know, and, and, you, and you had nothing. You lost your family home. You lost any chance for any kind of uh, job or, or economic upward mobility. I mean, what, what, what's going to create an extremist more than that? It's not this cartoonish, like you said, oh, they hate America. Like mm-hmm. W said, they hate us because we're free, so go shopping. I mean, that's, that's bullshit. You right. know, it's, it's what Ron Paul talked about for decades. It is blowback, mm-hmm. you know, when he was educating Newt Gingrich and Rudy Giuliani about that. And it's because we insist on being over there in their countries. That's going to lead to friction and problems. That's going to come back and bite us in the ass. And, they, you know, they call it unintended consequences, but the powers that be, they know about this. Mm-hmm. What's up, everybody? Um, we're going to take a quick break and tell you about the show's sponsors. Um, we are brought to you by Element T Electrolytes. 
I've been using this stuff for years, and what I've honestly found is that if I didn't have electrolytes before some kind of cardio, and sometimes even before workouts, that my workout performance, or definitely cardio performance, would suffer greatly. Um, Sodium is responsible for every single movement, pretty much, in your entire body. And let's say you drink a lot of caffeine, <laughs> like I like to do, then um, maybe it is a good idea, like I do every single morning, um, put some LMNT chocolate electrolytes um, there in your coffee to get a little bit more sodium, potassium, and uh, magnesium in your coffee so that way whatever diuretic effect you get from the caffeine is pretty much diluted by the fact that you put chocolate salt in it. Um, also it tastes really really good. Get some uh, chocolate cream or hazelnut cream or even coconut and uh, mix that all up. It tastes really really good. So uh, yeah, make sure you drop by, go to drinklmnt.com slash inliberty and health and uh, pick you up some electrolytes today. Alright guys, thanks. You know, they're not stupid. I mean they say the Iraq war was a mistake and a blunder. No, it wasn't. It was very deliberate. You know, Dick Cheney had a meeting early on uh, during the Bush administration uh, talking about where all the world's oil reserves are, saying ultimately this is the prize. So, you know, they weren't stupid. They knew what they were doing. Um, but they sold the American people a bill of goods. And unfortunately, there's still a lot of people who buy into that. And we keep repeating the same mistakes, expecting a different result which I think Edison said is in the height of insanity or the definition of insanity. I forget right. who said that quote, but you, you know, you get the point. And here we are now it's the Democrats, you know, who, who, who are kind of leading the charge. They're in power. They've got the executive branch, you know, they have, uh, I, I think they, they have the Congress currently or one part of I Congress, so, yeah. which I don't, by the time this comes out uh, tomorrow is Tuesday, the eighth. Mm -hmm. I do think the Republicans are going to, um, eke out majority, but honestly, so what? Nothing's really going to change. What's going to change? What's really going to change? I think, I, just gonna, I think they're just going to be more focused on China than Russia. Like, but honestly, they're probably not going to stop funding the you know proxy war in Ukraine. I really don't think oh. they will because most of them either. really haven't been good on that. Even the guy that we're supposed to believe is this you know second coming of Christ, Blake Masters. He even called for sanctions on Russia as soon as the war broke out. Like that's literally the same thing that every Democrat called for. And then he's even worse on China. He believes that. China's going to be over here on the shores of California. Like, or, dude, are you out of your fucking gourd? Like, this is the, the clown world that we're living in, that people believe that the chai comms are going to come over here and that Russia wants to reinstate the, the whole union. Like, th they're poor. China's poor. These countries, they don't have this capacity to take over the world. Do you really think they look at what we do? $31 trillion in debt, a million dead Iraqis, 22 to 30 you know, veteran suicides a day. Do you really think they look at that and say, wow, that, well, we should really model our country after that? I Call me crazy, but I don't think they do. All right. I want to emulate that. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I don't think so either. Yeah, that's uh... – yeah, but, you know, it has to be a, a, a cultural, a diplomatic and an economic thing to emulate. And we haven't been we haven't been stewards of that for a long time, unfortunately. And I, I do I I'm pessimistic sometimes. You know, I do think it is too late in a lot of ways. But sometimes I you know, and this is why I do this. I do a podcast and I appreciate coming on your show to talk about my opinions and how I feel about this. I do think it's still worth talking about and getting out there and trying to tell the people because, Maybe we could change our way in some small level and and uh, we could come back from the brink. You know, I, I at this point, I'm just like, man, if a fucking nuke doesn't go off, that's a miracle. That's the miracle I'm hoping for. Right. That's, a, you know, I don't know. It's uh, that's why we use humor <laughs> for a lot of this stuff, you know, <laughs> right. you know, because if we're not laughing, we're going to be crying, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, that's why I that's why Trump is. uh he went from the boardroom in The Apprentice to the Oval Office, and he's poised to do it again. Let nice. me tell you in your audience right now, like he's <laughs> he very well could do it again. Let me see. Write I him would... off at your own peril. I wanted to share something with you guys because this was something that got me initially to love Alex Jones as much as I do now. Okay. I only think because I had one not. You guys can hear that, right? Yeah. Okay. Tea Party member, yeah, uh, metal, yeah, and, 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 and like, like, look, Jews are just like anybody else. There's good people, there's bad people, but yeah, what happened? What happened to your head? I've been pile drived. You, somebody pile drived you. So you want to talk about what the real controllers of the Greys are? 
It looks like Sauron. Have you ever had a significant head injury? <laughs> you have? <laughs> what happened to you? I'm going to be honest with you. I, I'm kind of retarded. <laughs> In that... Go ahead, Joe. Admit it. Admit what? You think that he's a conspiracy theorist because he got dropped on his head. It's crazy, but he cured his depression. Uh, this is one of my favorites. So I... I'm asking because I don't know. I'm not asking to fuck with you. Listen, Listen to me! You really think, do you really think there's people <laughs> out there campaigning for late-term abortions? You think that shit's real? You the think that shit's real? voted Monday to keep it legal. Who would do that? Who would do that? that? Who would campaign what? for that? They the most fucking did it, That Bravo. is the craziest and shit you ever. You can't fucking admit it. They're fucking killing already more kids. So <laughs> it's real. Oh, I shit. had a fucking vote in the goddamn fucking Senate. That's what a the conspiracy fuck? theory. I am ready to be That's a conspiracy theory. You think just... you're fucking tough? You're about to get it. <laughs> oh, shit. They're killing already born babies. Stop fucking lying. God fucking damn it. I'm getting pissed now. Oh my god. <laughs> that I remember seeing that it Dude. like so I'm kind of retarded and then I, I remember seeing that and I just I, I lost it. <laughs> Joe, Joe, Joe. I'm kind of retarded. Rogan's like, ah <laughs> I remember that. Kyle, I have forgot about that freak out that he did, man. Because him and Eddie Bravo have been friends for a long time. And uh, yeah. you know, uh, Alex Jones and uh um Rogan had been friends since the late '90s, early aughts. Yeah, you know, they've been running together for a long time. Wow, that is, dude, he's over the top, man. Alex Jones mm -hmm. is, uh, you know, I, I, I need a quick 1.75 trillion, Kyle. Right? I don't know mm -hmm. if you got that hanging around your draw back there or underneath your Marshall half stack. I, I got, you know, I need, I got, I got, I got 996 million problems, and uh, Sandy Hook are all of them. It's all of them, you know, 99 problems, and the Sandy Hook is one, is number one. I got 996 problems, and the Sandy Hook is number one. <laughs> Infowars.com. I mean, they're really making an example out of them. They're going after them. Yeah. I mean, that, you know, they've been, you know, in a lot of my comedy shows that I've been doing the last four years since he first got deplatformed, I always mention that. Mm. And I say, you know, I kind of say half jokingly, first they came for Emmerich, you know, because that's his middle name. Yeah. Which is, it's hot German, by the way, Kyle. Emmerich's hot German, the Operation Paperclip. I don't even want to get into it right now, folks. My dad was a dentist. Uh, you know, I have helicopters, hot German stuff, paperclip, Andre von Bulo, a lot of stuff going on, Infowars.com. But, um, you know, he's, uh, yeah, I mean, he's, you know, he's like a cartoon fucking parody figure. And mm -hmm. maybe even if like 60 or 70% of what he says is true, it's mixed in with, with uh, so much that's not true. Yeah, that, uh, that there's the credibility gap, and then now with the fucking Sandy Hook, you can't even you talk about Alex Jones, you might as well be, might as well be talking about uh, yeah, a cartoon character. So, mm -hmm. yeah, and, and see, he admitted he got it wrong with Sandy Hook, and I I definitely think there should have been something done, but it, it, there that lawsuit is not about that, right? It's not about the damages to the families it's about making an example of somebody because he pushed you know he was a dissident to the regime that's what it's about it like i said if it's it was about, just about the families different story but it's clearly not about that it's about completely bankrupting and destroying him they mm -hmm. want to take all, all his money that he has and they want to take future earnings so he can't continue to operate and mm -hmm. have a media apparatus um you know because make no mistake uh Alex Jones and Roger Stone were a huge part of the reason that Donald Trump got elected in 2016 in the first place. Mm -hmm. You know, they they were not stupid, man. They co-opted that InfoWars audience, and Trump went on InfoWars in, like, December of 2015. He was like, you have a great reputation. I understand you do great work, and I'll never let you down. He's like, yeah, yeah, Donald. Yeah, Donald. You know what I mean? I don't know if you've ever seen the interview. It's amazing. You should see it. It's great mm -hmm. political pop art theater. Um, and just incredible that Infowars was, I think, given during the Trump administration, White House press credentials. Right. Um, and yeah, they're, 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 a lot of it's batshit. It's, it's, they rush to air, which Tim Pool does a lot. They go on air without knowing most of the information. But at the same mm -hmm. time, look at the New York Times. You know, right. I would just tell people, look at how the New York Times attacked and tried to discredit the victims of the Franklin scandal from the 80s and early 90s, which were all true. I mean, you, you go back and read the book by John DeCamp, um, you know, read Nick Bryant's book. It's all, that's just one example. And then going back to war and foreign policy, 
how the New York Times sold us the Iraq war. So they don't have any credibility in my mind either. And there's been no, there's no recompense for that. There's no uh, accountability. So yeah, what Alex Jones did with Sandy Hook is, is awful. And, you know, nobody should ever be attacked or uh, gone after, you know, especially who lost children in the school shooting. I mean, that's mm-hmm. like, that's like beyond the pale. I don't think Alex Jones was out there telling people to do that, but a lot of his audience took it the know, wrong way. Some of, yeah, some, I mean, you can't control They're the retarded. audience. I'm yeah, retarded. They're, yeah. They're retarded. My audience so, is retarded. <laughs> yeah. So that's, uh, that's the narrative that they're, mm-hmm. that they're selling and that they're shaping though, for sure. There was uh so so I heard that you guys also have a twin in Alex Jones. You see that, Mike, right? It's real. Oh god. <laughs> this is Rob doing Infowars.com. Alex Jones is about to confront the liberal media. Thank you. Yeah. This is the new Alex Jones right here. Look, I'm here to tell you folks, Donald Trump's tired of the New World Order. The New World Order is afraid of Donald Trump. Give me a round of applause for that. Hell yeah! New, we know Newt Gingrich is a bohemian grove eating the bones of the babies. He picks his teeth with the bones of the babies. They got fluoride in their water. 9-11 was an inside job. Larry Silverstein said, pull it. Infowars.com. <laughs> now, wait a minute. Bush, 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 they're drinking a chrome in the baby's brain, so they're drinking it. <laughs> that was Eric. I mean, that was a very surreal moment because, uh, you know, we've been we've been aware of Alex Jones and kind of following his career and impersonating him since 2006. And uh, that was like a full circle moment. Like, if I ever got the podcast with Emmerich, I would celebrate the wins, but I would also just try to talk to him truthfully about the bullshit. And yeah. I feel like the problem is you have the mainstream media, your fucking Colbert's and your... your um, New York Times and all those assholes who just want to eat his lunch and want to attack him and pull him down and denigrate him and label him this and that. And then you have the sycophants who don't want to question anything. I would yeah. just sit down with them and just try, try to have a fair conversation, which yeah, well, I do with any. And see, that's the problem is that they never want to treat him as a human being. If right. if he is so wrong, then it should be pretty easy to kind of call him out and show where he's wrong, which I'm sure you could easily do. But when you just completely deperson somebody, that's going to give him a lot more legitimacy in the eyes of the people who are already like kind of skeptical but like him or the people who really like him. Now you just completely – they're sold, right? They're, they're going to buy my bone broth, Kyle, every day of the week. They're going to, I know you like to lift weights. Yeah. I know you got that shark back there. It's Jaws. His name is Bruce in the movie. It never it didn't work half the time in fours. Like, I'm, they're going to buy my bone broth. They're going to buy my red pills, my dick pills, my in between pills, my soft pills, my heart pills, my steel magnolia pills. <laughs> and, you know, Embrick's all those things. I mean, but, but at the end of the day, he's very entertaining and, mm-hmm. he, and he draws controversy and he draws attention. So it's like a double edged sword, just like with Trump in 2016. They gave him $5 billion in free press coverage. Mm-hmm. They said that they hated him. Then the documents came out that showed that the Clinton campaign wanted to support him and build mm-hmm. him up to be the nominee because they thought he would be easy to contend with. Right. And the same shit is happening in 2022. You see all these Democratic campaigns and all these moneyed interests that are trying to prop up these retarded Republicans. And now they're the nominees. And now they're poised to beat the Democrats. So it's it's very disingenuous for a lot of these uh media sources and politicians and people to say that Alex Jones is this big boogeyman and this big enemy when he's, you know, I think at the end of the day, deep down, he he does, his heart is in the right place. You know, I I think there's times where he maybe went on air and knew that he, what he was saying wasn't true or not vetted. um, But I think his heart's in the right place. I know a lot of people that have worked with him that I respect and have had on my show. And, uh, yeah, I mean, the same can be said about Michael Moore. The same can be said about anybody in the political right. punditry class mm-hmm. who's made millions of dollars off of this shit. They right. just like to go after him because he's this cartoonish, you know, booming, uh, you know, southern good old boy Yeah, in a lot of ways. Right. So um, I wanted to get uh, Senator Paul's thoughts. Uh, listen here, Senator Paul. I did not perform gain-of-function research of that type. I did not perform that gain-of-function research, and I will not disclose to you or the Congress how much money I made from the vaccines. 
Well, let it just be known, Kyle, for the record and for the Senate panel, that Dr. Fauci, you've refused thus far to answer any of my questions. <laughs> there were labs in Ukraine that were doing spike protein work and looking at gain of function, and you refused to talk about it. You furthermore let the committee know and the panel understand you've never answered my claims of dogfighting with Michael Vick. And you will have to answer it one day. Me and RFK Jr. will be coming to your house with our, with our lawn trimmings. Look, I, I have to say, I, walk, I take my dog for a walk in the park all the time. We wear a mask. We socially distance. We wear two masks sometimes when it's really necessary, when there's lots of people that wear my two masks, right? But look, we're all vaccinated. And I promise you, I did not perform gain of function research of that type. And I did not take any profits. I promise. <clears throat> you can see my excitement with your answer, Mr. Fou Dr. F Dr. Frankenstein, Dr. Fauci. <laughs> I'm very excited to be here. There's nothing I'd rather be doing other than doing eye, eye research and eye surgery down in Latin America at the expense of my own gold coin shekel uh, safe left to me by my father. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm very <laughs> happy to be here, Kyle. What about the cereal, happy. Mike? Talk about the cereal. Do you, Kyle, support putting puberty blockers in the cereal of children and their cinnamon toast crunch in the Castro neighborhood of San Francisco near Speaker Pelosi's husband's house? Look, much Are like in favor of that. <laughs> much like Senator Paul here, I I can't even do the Ron DeSantis, the Ron DeSanctimonious. <laughs> much like Senator Paul, I saw a gay person walking down the street, and I didn't like it because he was talking to a five year old about how he's gay and how he's banging all these other dudes. So you know, what? I put a bill through the Senate, and we're going to pass it. And we're going to ban that here in the free state of Florida. Dude, did you see DeSantis's face during the debate? Uh, with, uh, yeah, okay, so yeah. actually, I uh, just very derpy. <laughs> I think the king it? fucking railroads him. Yeah, no, so, no, no, so do I. So, this is what you were you. talking about. You're running for governor. This is the weakest I've seen. We, we got Charlie Cock. Charlie Cock. Elected, you will serve a full four year term as governor. Yes or no? This was the weakest I've seen DeSantis. Yes or no, Ron? Will you serve a full four-year term if you're reelected? short Dude, his wiring went short, yeah. It's a fair question. His comeback was pretty good, though. We did not agree on the candidates asking each other. Was his comeback, Kyle? I'm sorry. Oh, here. It's coming. Well, listen, I Watch. know that Charlie's interested in talking about 2024 and Joe Biden, but I just want to make things very, very clear. The only worn-out old donkey I'm looking to put out to pasture is Charlie Chris. Nice. <laughs> I got to give it to him. That was pretty it's good. Based. That's good. This was, I, was, Chris, was Chris part of that documentary, Outrage? Did you, did you guys ever see that? Mm -mm. That's a like documentary Chris, about the gay Republicans. I, I feel like Charlie Chris is gayer than front row at Elton John. <laughs> I, could, I could be wrong, though. Um, <laughs> that, that, um, Charlie Cock. I originally thought that DeSantis would kind of whoop Trump's ass. But then after watching that, I'm like, oh, if Trump really goes after him, I don't think DeSantis is quick enough on his feet to refute the king. <laughs> no, I mean, Chris, you know, Chris has been around for a while. That guy has zigzagged whatever he's he's a chameleon, whatever he has to do to have power. Um, but he caught DeSantis flat footed there. Mm -hmm. that, he that's, really did. Yeah. And dude, the king. I remember the king. Destroying another Florida governor. His name is Jeb Bush. <laughs> he's like, please clap. <laughs> everybody, <laughs> he's like, everybody knows you're tough, Jeb. You're so tough, Jeb. Look, Jeb's a nice guy. He's a nice guy. But America doesn't need nice. We need tough. We need strong. Neither of which is Jeb Bush. Okay. <laughs> and he ate. He's like, the World Trade Center came down during your brother's reign. That's not safe. When he did that, dude, that was a ton of bricks that fell on Jeb's head. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, you know, DeSantis, I think DeSantis is a little fucking ahead of his, I think he's a little flip for his britches, man. Donald mm -hmm. Trump has been world famous for 50 years. Mm -hmm. And right. DeSantis, DeSantis is what, 40, how old is he, 45? I, I, if, I want to say it's early 40s, maybe even I'm, late 30s, if I remember. I'm, he's not that old at all. I'm going to look it up right now, Kyle. Hold on. Okay. But um, yeah, like I said, I don't think he's ready. He's really good when it comes to just like a monologue. Like he could speak very well and he's good at kind of pushing back against the media. But in a debate, I don't think he's that sharp. 
All right. So De- I agree. DeSantis is 44. Mm-hmm. He was born in September of 1978. Dude, the king was already fucking beyond prime time. Oh, my God. He, he was already dealing with asparagus and- piss and fucking writing books. <laughs> Look, I was doing things in Studio 54 in 1978 when little Ron was sanctimonious, was born, that would make his head spin, quite frankly. You know, I, I, I think Trump I think Trump clears the fucking field in the mm-hmm. GOP primary. Don't even bother running. We saw Tom Cotton, neocon, China hawk, mm-hmm. Zionist piece of fucking trash. Tom Cotton ruled out a run. Did you see that? Mm-hmm. No, no. Uh, he's, he's not going to run. Oh, oh, okay. He's wow. not going to run for president because mm. he's understands that Trump just clears the whole field. Yeah, I know Mark, or, uh, Mike Pompeo was thinking about uh, running as well, but <sighs> I think Pompeo might do it. Haley might do it. Well, no, Haley said she wouldn't if Thank the king, if the king runs. Chris Christie's on the. Fa- I just, I just, I think Trump clears the field yeah. for the GOP primary, and it's a matter. It's a matter of battling out for it to be his VP and to be in the cabinet. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think – I don't see Ron DeSantis being the kind of guy to you know pass the torch and not be a leader. Like he is – he's like presidential kind of material, if you know what I mean. Like very well-spoken, he's giga well-dressed. Chad. Yeah, total Giga Chad for Israel. So, I mean, you know, he, he <laughs> checks off the Israel. boxes. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, CIA background, military background, younger Yale. dude who, who has – Oh, yeah. Yeah. I yeah. mean, he's, like I said, checks all the boxes. He's the perfect Republican president. But um, Trump comes with a lot of baggage. And I think the younger portion of his base is probably sick of him. But the older people don't give a shit. Right. That's kind of my shake of it. The younger people probably like Ron DeSantis more because, like, if you look on Twitter, all the polls favor DeSantis. But then when you look at, like, the polls on the news, yeah. they all favor Trump. <laughs> well, remember, there was Iowa straw polls that favored me, Kyle. I don't know if you remember those ones. They were I don't know what, what, what was a Laffy Taffy poll, but they favored me. I was a guy until I wasn't the guy. Listen, Rand, I haven't once insulted your appearance, but trust me, there's a lot there. He's like, I gave you a lot of money, Rand. And Rand's just like, because he knows it's true, you know? He, you know he, he knows the king's right, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think with Trump, I think they want to give it one more go. And then because, like Eric was saying, DeSantis is so young that, dude, just be governor of Florida. Just, yeah. just enjoy your fiefdom down in Florida. I mean, mm. they love him down there. Oh even, yeah. Even though he gave a really horrible debate performance, so what? Who cares? Like, oh, dude, that's not going to shake people's love for him. There's exactly there's a view yeah. of him like so. Even early on during the whole flu world order bullshit in 2020, he did go along with the lockdowns for maybe a month, month and a half, a couple months, whatever it was, and then was was pretty based about it. Which I have to give him, I have to give him credit for that. Oh yeah, he was, but. You know, they're, they're going to use that against them. I mean, they're going to use anything they can against them. So give the king one more go, okay? I mean, Trump. Trump's not young. He's 70. He's a 76-year-old man, you know? And he's. I think he's good. They want to They want to just do one more time, man. They've they got so much hate and so much spite and so much anger left over from 2020 that I think it would be enough to propel the king to do another run for the White House. And I don't think... I don't think he would want to pick DeSantis as his VP because he'd be worried about being outshined. And I don't think DeSantis would want to do that because that's like a demotion. Like being the VP. Look at Mike Pence. He smelled Trump's farts for eight years. Mm -hmm. And and then, you know, on on J6, the national holiday, J6, I I said maybe he should be hanged for treason, you know, okay, quite frankly. And that's what he thinks about him. So who really wants to be Trump's VP? So I think Trump does it in uh, 24, gets the nomination. And then DeSantis runs in 28. I don't know. That's just my thinking right now. In- yeah. Yeah. I, I don't Who know. Knows? If, I don't know if DeSantis plans to back down or not because he seems he seems pretty set on doing it. But um, you know, I, I like I like we've kind of just been saying they're I don't think he's ready to take on the king. You know, just enjoy your the the free state of Florida being a king DeSantis. Remember the last time? Remember the last time a governor from Florida tried to run against Trump? How well that that worked out? (laughs) Yeah, not very well. Um, Yeah, so uh, I'm I'm all for it though. I would love to see the bloodbath. I think it would be absolutely hilarious. (laughs) Ratings like you've never seen, Kyle. This will be the biggest rated episode since we had Meatloaf fighting with. With Gary Busey about his watercolors, quite frankly. <laughs> It'll be the biggest thing we've ever seen since then. Oh, it would be everything. And, and when you honk and when you just kind of 
understand that the United States is an empire in decline and our best days are behind us, you root for a fucking DeSantis versus Trump. Well, you know what? Honestly, um, I know Reed's talked about this a little bit, our boy here, um, but I'm all for Fetterman Walker 2024. I, I will I will fully endorse John. <laughs> I, I endorse John Fetterman for Senate. Bring on the clown show. Bring on the nukes. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm all for it. I, and, and I stand. Like, yeah, me. I stand and, for fracking. I stand. <laughs> I stand against for fracking. Hello, good night. Hello, goodbye. Don't know why you say goodbye. I say fracking. Dude, John Fetterman's so retarded. Doctor Oz is so retarded. They're the Herschel goals we Walker. deserve. And yeah, uh, yeah. No, that that's why Reed Reed is a nihilistic acceleration, which is yeah. which is what I oscillate between optimism and complete fucking nihilistic acceleration. So mm-hmm. he's he's right on the money when he says that. Put Herschel Walker in the Senate. Put him in there. This bad. <laughs> yeah. Deputize him. He could protect against another the next J six because he's he's deputized. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, my it's, God. It's, it's all so incredible. I mean, it's just it's clown world. It's complete clown world. And your average person is like pretty turned off by it because oligarchs run the whole show and it it doesn't it doesn't fucking matter. It doesn't really matter anymore. Yeah, it's it's a very sad state of affairs, but um, you know, at least we have a podcast where we could talk to each other like this and uh kind of shoot the shit and just enjoy each other's company while the whole world burns around us, unfortunately. Yeah, that's it. Um, so anyways, yeah, we've been going for a little bit, guys. This was a lot of fun and I can't wait to share this with everybody. Um, Mike, where can everybody find you, brother? I'm not on Twitter and I'm not on Instagram, but Eric is. That's the that's the that's the difference between the twins, I guess. I don't use Twitter. Um I do have a Venmo, uh, Mike Jackman, 1986. If you guys like my impersonations, you want an impersonation request, you want to support Jackman Radio, um, we're on Patreon at uh, patreon.com slash Jackman Radio. Uh, YouTube channel is Jackman Radio. We have our three comedy specials, um, all of our interviews, all of our podcasts, uh, a lot of great research, a lot of great work. This month, November, marks the 59th anniversary of the real coup d'etat, which removed our 35th president, JFK. And I will be doing several episodes this month uh, talking about really great JFK research. I got some really great guests coming up this week in the next couple of weeks on Jackman Radio on YouTube that I hope everybody will check out. Nice. Well, I'll definitely have to check that out because that's something that I've never uh, – I've heard of, but I'm going to be completely honest. I absolutely know nothing about. Um, Kyle, we could do a whole – I could come on and do three hours on JFK without notes because I've been <laughs> studying since before 9-11, quite frankly. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's another thing, too. Trump said the JFK files were going to come out in 2017 when they legally should have come out, and they didn't. Mm-hmm. And Biden's kicking the can down the road. Why is it that both parties are continuing to cover up 59 years later if there was only one shooter and it was just Oswald? All right. Well, we'll probably because they show about. They, they they show him the film before they uh you know seat them as president. <laughs> like, Bill, right. like, Bill, like Bill Hicks said, right? They show yeah, him yeah. another angle in the Shapooter film. They're like, any questions? Yeah. <laughs> they say, you see that convertible going down through Dallas? Yeah, that 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 will be you. <laughs> Pretty much, <laughs> Eric. What about you, brother? Yeah, no. With everything Mike said, we're on Podbean, we're on Spotify, and um. You know, I like I like what you said earlier, Kyle. We can't be so dug in and have these purity tests and everything has to be rigid. You got to be this. You got to be that. Dude, we're all a human race, man, here on one small planet. We have to get along with each other. We got to find common grounds. It's going to be compromise. It's going to be give and take. So I appreciate you having us on, man. And congratulations on your wedding. I hope you have a nice honeymoon. And, uh, you know, I love what you're doing. So keep doing what you're doing, Kyle. This is awesome. Thanks, man. Well, I really appreciate it. And uh, you and your brother are both an inspiration for me. And I'm sure many, many other people as well. So, yeah, if you guys have any more uh, closing thoughts, we'll close her out. Just say uh, I hope for peace and uh, no nuclear exchange. And uh, everybody have fun with the time we're given on planet Earth. Absolutely. The end will be swift, as Tim Dillon says. (laughs) All right. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Make sure you like, subscribe, and share. And until next time, take care.